So hi everyone. Uh, so as has uh, as Henry explained, my name is Einar Davis. Uh, I work for Mentor Business. Uh, so Mentor Business is one of Wales's leading economic development companies, um, and we deliver the Famine Connect program on behalf of the Welsh government. Um, so Farming Connect is a, a multifaceted um, programme uh, with a vast suite of, of different support packages integrated within it um, to support, inform and motivate the industry in changing times. Um, I'll quickly share this slide with you to start. Um, this just demonstrates our overarching themes and priorities, really. I'd like to draw your attention specifically to the, to the human capital theme that you can see there um, at the top. Um, that, again, is intrinsic to all Farming Connect activities. And as a company, really, Mentor a Business um, has been supporting people, businesses and communities in Wales for over 30 years. Um, and developing people has been central to all of our work, really, uh, across uh, since since the uh, the company was was uh, was launched um, at the end of the 80s. Um, so we're, we're firm believers um, that businesses cannot evolve and adapt unless the people within those businesses have been supported through the key stages of change. Um, so the whole Family Connect programme is, um, the whole delivery then is based around this model. Um, so people could be at different stages of the model uh, with different elements of their business. Uh, and all of our delivery is, is then um, tailored to supporting people at these stages. And we've got KPIs in place then to measure um, the impact of our, um, of our schemes for, for each stage. Um, so different delivery mechanisms are offered depending on the needs of the individual. So um, somebody could be at, at one stage for one element of their business. So they might be just um, not ready. They're not aware that they've got a problem. So they're just um, gathering information and, and maybe going to a, a, an open event maybe. And with, with something else, they might be ready to take action. They might have, have realized that they've got an issue maybe with, with something within their business. So they, may, they might have progressed on to the, the advisory service, so they're really taking action to make some changes within their business. So that's essentially what, what the programme is, is based around, but it all comes back to people really and tailoring the support around the needs of, of the people in, in the business. Um, so we've currently, um, just for a bit of context for you in terms of the scale of the programme, we've currently got over 22,000 individuals registered um, with Farming Connect, um, and those come from, um, I think we're up to around 11,000 businesses, farming businesses that we, we are engaged with. So today... I've been asked to focus on our support schemes for new entrants in particular, as you know. So I will be focusing specifically on the Agri Academy and Venture. Um, however, new entrants can actually access all, all aspects of the Farming Connect programme, including um, the business advice element, the technical advice, subsidized training courses um, we've got modular learning um, programs such as prosper from pasture which offers um, group based um, intensive grassland management support um, agriscope which i've got there on the slide um, agriscope brings groups of like-minded people together um, to share challenges with each other and come up with solutions. Um, and that's done in a facilitated manner with, uh, with a coach and mentor. There's quite a lot of, of emphasis really, in, uh, specifically in terms of our um, elements of the programme that, that focus on personal development. Um, we do use a lot of coaching and mentoring techniques in our delivery, um, which uh, we feel are, are really, really valuable. Um, we've also got a framework of mentors um, who are, are actually farmers. So our mentors are all farmers, uh, experienced farmers who are, are sharing their knowledge and life experience with the younger generation. Um, 
and yeah just just to reiterate again really the business planning element you know it's 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 a it's a central part of the program but that has um that in particular has been invaluable for hundreds of young farmers um if they might need a business plan to apply for a tenancy for example or if they would be um seeking finance from a bank um so the the business planning element is is really um really valuable so just to talk briefly then about the Agri Academy to start off with. So um, we've got two elements of the Agri Academy, the Business and Innovation Programme and our Junior Programme, uh, which is for 16 to 19 year olds who are, are hoping to um, go into a career within agriculture um, or food production or land management. Um, so again, as I mentioned, there's strong emphasis here on personal development and we've got our, our Agri Academy leader is a trained um, coach and, and mentor. So that's really central to the methodology of it, really. Um, it, the, what's really important as well is, is the, the group based learning. Um, so the applicants are selected um, and they a big, big part of, of the experience is actually um, developing those relationships and friendships. And what we've seen um, since the Academy was launched in 2012, um, they're really long lasting relationships that are built and, and people build a, a network really of contacts within the industry, which is, uh, which is really, really valuable to them as well. Um, so uh, the programme is, is three residential weekends, including a study visit, usually an overseas study visit, which unfortunately hasn't obviously uh, been able to take place um, this year or last year then. Um, 12 are selected uh, per programme. There is no age restriction actually for the business and innovation programme. So some might argue that it isn't specifically a, a new entrance scheme for that reason. Um, but we tend to see um, younger people apply for the Agri Academy. However, sometimes we do get the, the odd older farmer um, being selected and, and keen to, to get involved. And we've seen that that actually does um, kind of um, add value to, to the group. Uh, it gives you, it, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. And it's, I think it's really good to have um, sort of a, an older person actually thrown into the mix as well, um, just to, to sort of um, give a kind of, um, yeah, give an, an older perspective, I suppose. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of emphasis on learning beyond agriculture. So um, the study visits and kind of visits to various businesses tend to be outside of agriculture quite a bit, or on, not just outside of agriculture, but maybe looking at um, alternative sectors. So obviously in Wales, we are predominantly beef, sheep, dairy. Um, so um, as you can see in the photo here, this was a visit to a market garden in Copenhagen um, in 2018. Um, so we try and get them to, to, you know, it's a cliche, but think outside of the box, really. Um, move on to the... So um, in terms of the program, um, the members are encouraged to explore solutions to current challenges. So um, changes in consumer trends, for example, uh, is, is often a, a kind of hot topic. Um, so communication skills comes into that really. How do we um, kind of, how do we share our, um, you know, how do we tell our story? How, how, how do we tell the, the story of agriculture really to consumers? Um, and kind of shortening the gap between the producer and consumer. Um, so a lot of marketing and brand, branding um, comes into it in terms of the topics then for the, for the various um, training, um, training elements and the, and the speakers that we tend to get in. Um, so yeah, I've already mentioned communication skills, media training is a big part of the academy. Um, we try and, and use the academy to foster ambassadors um, to represent new entrants really in uh, for agriculture in Wales. Um, so we're really pushing them out of their comfort zones. Um, communication skills, um, as I'll explain later, I think is, is absolutely invaluable for, for the younger generation. Um, with kind of more traditional 
um, communication methods not being used as as much now. Um, we're we're obviously speaking a lot less face to face and and on the phone and stuff. So um, I think that that uh, the skill is really really important to to keep that skill um, with our younger generation. Um, so what has worked well, um, yes, capacity building, I've talked a bit about this already, capacity building, getting out of the comfort zones, looking outside of agriculture, um, actually allowing time for social interaction as well. So if, if anyone was, was to develop any kind of similar scheme, it's really important not to um, kind of jam pack the programme with loads and loads of different speakers coming in. Um, the the hour here and there of free free time to um, kind of build those friendships and relationships and build that network um, is is really important as well. Um, some of the challenges and things that haven't quite worked so well with the Ag Agri Academy, um, not many really. Um, Sometimes if one member might miss a session, um, they're not as invested in the programme, they kind of lose momentum um, and that then in a way, because it's, it's based around the group learning, it kind of weakens the, the sort of the group, um, the, the dynamics really within the group then. Um, also, yeah, the last 18 months have been really, really challenging for the Agri Academy. Um, we have been delivering digitally, so they have, so the, the class of 2020 have had um, webinars, basically speakers coming in on Zoom to talk to them. But what we have missed is that, um, you know, the, the friendships that I'm talking about, the building, that network, they haven't met each other face to face at all. Um, so we've really missed that. And it's really identified how important that element of the academy is. Um, so that's it with the Agri Academy. Um, I am going to share with you just a couple of slides on the management exchange. Um, just quickly, I won't run this. Oh, I won't run this video. I didn't want the sound there. Um, oh, I can't reach that now. Anyway, you don't really need to see that video. Um, it just basically tells you that what the uh, exchange is, is um, basically a travel scholarship. Um, so we offer funding of up to two and a half thousand pounds to travel to a country um, to study a topic um, of their choice. Um, so again, this isn't necessarily a new entrant program, but it's a good example of how individuals progress through Family Connect, through the Family Connect journey. They tap into various services then, depending on their needs. And we can clearly see um, how um, their confidence is growing with each intervention. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here. Hugh Jones, for example, a young farmer who um, he identified the need to broaden um, the scope of the farming enterprise at home. Oh, that's automatically changing there. Let's go back to Hugh for a minute. So he looked into milking sheep um, and then the complementary support that he um, accessed then was Agriscope. So he got into a group with other new entrants to dairy sheep. Um, he's accessed technical advice with a specialist vet and he's being mentored by older, more experienced farmers who's also who have also diversified. I hope this isn't going to continue changing like this automatically, um, or this is going to be a bit of a disaster. I will carry on. Um, so John Goodwin, again, selected for the Agri Academy uh, in 2019. And since then, he's taken advantage of further opportunities, uh, which he most likely wouldn't have had the confidence to do, actually, before um, going on the Agri Academy it empowered him to explore alternative land use um, on his farm um, and he be began looking into truffle farming actually um, so yeah it's, I just wanted to share this because it just shows how important it is to have different kind of aspects so so it's really important it's really valuable that um that we are sitting within the wider sort of Farming Connect umbrella with so many different interventions. Um, so somebody can choose really what, what intervention is, is suitable for them at this particular point in time. Um, so, so that's really, really um, important. So 
yeah, finally, I'd like to talk about venture, um, the main focus of my presentation really today. Um, so venture is our flagship programme for new entrants into agriculture. Um, it's designed to increase mobility within the industry um, through a matchmaking service. Um, and we also off offer a package of support to guide people through the, the main steps really of setting up um, a joint venture. Um, again, you know, what's key to the success, I, I go on about this, but the fact that it is part of the wider Famine Connect umbrella. Um, so being able to tap into various um, kind of optional extras, as you see on this slide here. Um, so AgriScope and, and the mentoring is there. If somebody needs it, we, we don't force it on them. It, it isn't a, a, a kind of rigid um, program of services that they've got to tap into. It just depends on their needs, really. Um, and we work with them to identify those needs and, and kind of um, signposting to the to the relevant service. Um, and that's, of course, because every journey into setting up a joint venture is going to be different. Um, not that there's no kind of one size fits all kind of process for, for setting up a joint venture. Uh, people are going to be in different places, really, in terms of their relationships. Some of them might know each other for years, having been work, working together, but now ready to kind of formalize an agreement. Uh, but then, of course, we also have um, people who are, ha haven't met each other since joining the venture program. Um, and some might be really confident in speaking to, to somebody that, who they don't know. And, and another new entrant would really struggle with that, really, and would need quite a bit of help with, with communication skills and just raising their confidence, really, to be able to, to um, kind of share their ideas in terms of where they, they would see the business um, to go. Um, yeah, so... Um, so, for example, if, if we had somebody who would be super confident and maybe going in going into the joint venture like a, a bit of a bull in the tri in a china shop, um, sometimes you know they might not have a viable business idea or they might need training to understand um, balance sheets, for example. But often they're not aware that they've got those skills gaps um that's what we've we've found so that's where the complementary elements that i've got here um so agriscope um we would put them in a group with other individuals going through the same process um so they can learn from each other and realize for themselves um where those skills gaps are really and, and they, they kind of compare each other then really um so it, it's definitely more successful if somebody realizes for themselves where they where they need to to kind of address any any um any weaknesses i suppose um okay so this following slide it shows the numbers involved in the scheme at the moment um so to date we have established 43 new joint ventures um so that's yeah 80 um sorry 86 people then we've supported um to to go into a joint venture together um, some, as I said, will be known to each other already, long-term employees or long-term tenants wanting to, to formalise an agreement. Um, the scheme can also be used by farming families. Um, so, for example, a joint venture will sometimes help to facilitate succession within the farming family. Um, so, um, one example would be where a sibling, so one sibling that would wants to farm can go into a joint venture with the parents um, build up equity within the business then in order to be in a better position to be able to pay the others out for example um, so it's really flexible actually um, what we, we can support which is which is really important um, so this slide just shows um, the sectors that are, are predominant here in Wales. Um, I think, yeah, we've, we have had some opportunities in, in other parts of Wales um, where, um, so, sorry, what am I saying? I th um, there are some opportunities in, in some parts of Wales to encourage more uh, new entrants to consider other sectors. So, yeah, there are 
potential in some regions to do more on horticulture, for example, market gardens are definitely a, a potential um, market. Um, but we have maybe some work to do to try and encourage our new entrants to, to see those opportunities. Um, but in reality, um, it isn't a viable option for the majority of land in Wales due to the topography and climate. Um, we have recently held a webinar on, on vertical farming, uh, which attracted a large audience. So the interest is there. Um, we have horticulture focus sites as part of our demonstration programme, who are trialling asparagus growing and picking on pumpkins. Um, but as you can see from these graphs here, um, both the demand for land and also the land available is predominantly for beef, sheep or dairy production at the moment. Um, it is, you know, quite likely that we might see that change over the coming years. Um, but uh, at the moment, it's it's difficult to tell how things will go with uncertainties with um, subsidies and, and things changing um, at the moment. So we've currently got five opportunities advertised on our website and as you can see here they are of varying scales um, so the smallest one there is um, just under 10 hectares um, and then the largest one which is a new one that we've had on this week uh, which is in Tregaron which is in, in Mid Wales which is a 730 acre um, extensive unit, um, beef and sheep unit, with um, quite a lot of opportunities for conservation grazing um, and looking at biodiver increasing biodiversity and um, that's where we see the, the, the public goods um, opportunities come into to that one in particular. Um, so there's opportunities to, you know, the, the, the we have quite a bit of work sometimes to try and um, encourage the new entrants to appreciate the um the goals and aspirations of the landowner as well so that landowner is is keen to keep that extensive system um and he doesn't want to increase stocking numbers that much so um you know we've got a role to play to manage expectations um in terms of that and the on the flip side as well you know we have landowners um offering some opportunities and um, it is very understocked or it isn't being managed managed to the best of its, its potential. Um, so we've got some work to do then to kind of encourage and, and um, support the landowner to see that they've, they've got potential to do more with that land. Um, right. I'm not sure, I don't think I need to go into much detail on the actual matchmaking process because it's rather self-explanatory. Um, we did restructure this process in January of this year to make it more accessible for potential seekers. Um, now, it, this might come as a bit of a surprise to you, but actually, despite having plenty of, of new entrants enrolled um, on the scheme and, and looking for opportunities, um, we are only seeing a small number of applicants applying for the opportunities when they when they are actually um, published. So the, the competition for the, the opportunities isn't massive. And I think there are a variety of reasons for, for this, we believe. Um, one of them is um, not wanting to move out of their, their local area. That, that is still um, a tie, really, tying people down to their to the local area where they've, where they've been brought, born and raised. Um, people, uh, some of them aren't willing to consider a joint venture as a stepping stone onto bigger, bigger opportunities. So they might feel that some of the opportunities that we've got are too small, um, they're not viable on their own. Uh, what we try and encourage them to consider is, is whether it's something that they could do um, as a part-time option to start off with and then build up then into a, into a, a bigger opportunity when they've got more experience and, and more capital. Um, poor communication skills um, has been a bit of a barrier. We, we are finding it difficult to actually communicate with some of our new entrants. 
um, they, they are they are the best in in replying to emails and replying to phone calls, um, which I'm sure those of you working closely with with the younger generation will be able to appreciate. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about um, our communication methods later on, really, and how we've kind of overcome that. Um, and a bit about, yeah, I, I've mentioned this earlier, but the provider or the landowner resistance to change as well. So um, that uh, has often been the case. So um, if a um, new entrant comes in and has got a really um, innovative um, business idea for that piece of land, uh, but the landowner really doesn't want to, to change really and wants to carry on farming um, the land as it has been farmed for generations. Um, so uh, yeah, since January then we've, we've changed, we've sort of restructured things a little bit though. So the web, uh, so opportunities have been published on the website anonymously. Um, prior to that, seekers had to enrol fully with the programme before they could actually see the opportunities. Um, so we've opened that up and make, made it more accessible um, just to try and raise the profile of the scheme even further, really. Um, another aspect which is absolutely key, really, to the success of venture is the advisory service aspect. So I'm just outline it here for you so basically once once they've been matched up um both parties then can access fully funded business planning and legal advice up to the value of three thousand euros and i think without that element um we, we probably wouldn't have half as many joint ventures established um they wouldn't have been so carefully drawn out uh, with that professional advice um they wouldn't have um sort of so both parties um, with the advisory service both parties are involved in the development of the joint venture um so communication is absolutely key as we all know for any kind of joint enterprise um so by um providing this formal kind of advice service then we're ensuring that that both parties are involved in the in the setting up of the business and their goals and aspirations and and things are, are kind of aligned um exit strategies are essential um so by ensuring that we've got that professional coming in to facilitate this um, we're ensuring the solicitor involvement in the drawing of the agreements. Um, so obviously there's less risk than um, if things don't work out as intended. So we've been working really closely with Dr. Neris Llewellyn Jones from Agri Advisor Solicitors. I'm sure some of you will be um, familiar with Neris. Um, so Neris has helped us really to develop the, the program um, and her team are quite heavily involved in providing the legal guidance to um, potential joint ventures. So alongside Neris, we've developed this wheel of legal structures um, and we consider all of these um, as um, varieties of, of joint ventures. Um, we thought it was actually a barrier to engagement um, and a barrier to, to mobility really within the industry that many assumed that joint ventures always referred to share farming or contract farming. But in fact, we consider a joint venture to be any kind of business where two or more um, parties come together to work, to work towards a common goal. So expanding that criteria um, has allowed us to um, expand our reach, um, further supporting new entrants um, who are just starting out. And maybe, um, you know, they, they might not be ready for that joint venture yet, so to make that commitment. So they might be just looking for an employment contract to begin with. What we would encourage is that um, within that employment contract, they might build in a, a bonus scheme or something, for example, so that they've got that kind of, um, they're, they're invested in the business. So we start seeing that kind of um the the kind of business minded um um kind of um yeah start getting to getting them to think about how 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 they'd run a business rather than just working for somebody else um so yeah things like um putting in kpis for example into their contract even if they're just an employee um okay so these are just um 
case studies I've got here. I'm more than happy to share my presentation afterwards. Uh, there's a couple of links here to um, for you to read these these full case studies. They are all on the Family Connect website if if you want to go and have a look. Um, so these are the uh, some of the um, joint ventures that have been set up and, and supported through the scheme. Um, so some of our key messages here, they, they're just kind of, um, yeah, uh, I've, I've talked a bit already about some of the barriers that we've we've been facing. Um, so the, these are sort of our key messages really to, to the, the new entrants that we're working with. Um, so we try and encourage them to, to venture out of their comfort zones and, and that's really why we've got all these different um, programmes then to, to kind of facilitate that. Um, we try and encourage them to, to try something that they haven't been expecting. So they might have an idea in mind for their dream joint venture, their dream farm. Um, and we, we try and get them to, to sort of, you know, put that on the back burner for now, maybe, and, and settle for something um, smaller to start off with and, and use it as a stepping stone, which comes on to my, my next point. Um, our... A pro, the programme of, of events and workshops and stuff that we put on, we, we do um, try and um, tie into that the, the, the element of risk taking and try and get them to, to be more entrepreneurial um, and, and think about the risks that they're going to have to take. Um, not assume anything. So again, coming back to the communication skills, um, encouraging them to ask, ask the, the stupid questions. Um, um yeah flexibility in a joint venture really really important so despite having that wheel of, of 12 kind of business models um by having the advisory service there each um each joint venture is is specifically um designed for the individual's needs so not not one one of them is the same they, they're all different um and that's really important really it's um we wouldn't advocate an off-the-shelf agreement, um, for example. Yeah, communication, I've, I've talked about, about, about that already. Respecting the landowner, so yeah, it goes back to sort of um, acknowledging what they would like to do with the land and kind of reaching a, a kind of middle ground, really, in terms of that. Um, and yeah, just taking the professional advice. It's really um, crucial that we've, we can offer that professional advice, I think. I don't think a matching service would be as successful unless that professional advice was there actually to, to kind of take them to the next step. Um, that's our venture handbook. Um, it is available hard copy and also um, online we worked closely with the uh, fresh start land enterprise center uh, and alison rick i don't, don't know if alison's listening i didn't spot her um but um yeah and we've um i've been um working closely with with similar schemes across the whole of the uk really and and comparing kind of barriers and and how we overcome those barriers which has been really really helpful uh, and just a couple of slides to finish um, on on communication, really. Have I got time, Henry? Well, we are a bit over because it's already oh, sort of like 40 minutes in. So, okay, uh, so. Can you give me two minutes, two minutes, one and a half. Fantastic. And um, so communication, really important when when designing any scheme for new entrants and um, traditional methods tend not to work. Um, so I'll just share with you quickly some of the things that we've done to overcome that. So we've launched a podcast. Uh, we've we've got over 17,000 downloads on that podcast now, which which proves that it's a popular kind of um, communication method, really. So definitely moving away from um, or definitely by now, anyway, moving away from the, the sort of online web webinars um 
the uh, we've set up a Facebook group because uh, one of the negative aspects of being part of Family Connect, the wide, there's so many things on offer, is sometimes if you want to tailor a message to a specific group of people like joint met like new entrants, um, it can sometimes get lost. So we've set up the Facebook group as a, a dedicated space. Um, also focus on our Instagram platform, which is is really important because it that, that's tailored content then for the the target audience in mind. But on the other hand, um, venture wouldn't exist without the the other side of the equation, that the landowner, of course. So we are also looking at how we communicate with the older generation. So uh, just at the top right hand corner there, we commissioned a um, an advert for S4C, uh, which was broadcast sorry, on S4C after the uh, popular Fermio programme. Our conference this year, clearly a digital event, uh, but we are really feeling that people are fed up of Zoom webinars. Um, so what we did was we produced short, short films of each speaker, uh, which was available to view on our YouTube channel. And the most popular one actually was this particular one, um, which featured three first generation farmers um, who were sharing their experiences of building successful businesses, despite being born and raised um, off farm um finally yeah try and keep things fresh so we um what's really important is that farming connect allows us to develop new concepts if we feel this is needed so business boot camp is one example here of a bit of a spin-off of the agri academy specifically designed for new entrants um new branding and, and fresh content was critical really in keeping the younger generation's attention um in this scheme um so this is my final slide henry will be pleased to know so i'll just finish <laughs> by sharing my uh, contact details with you and also the two venture officers um Gwydion and Delith and I think I'll finish as well by saying um thank you really to Welsh Government because we are so fortunate here in Wales to have a scheme such as Farming Connect which offers something for everyone really um and as I've explained it allows us as a contractor to to tailor our support to each, in each individual's needs and then track their progress along the whole journey um also, it allows us to adapt the program as the needs of the industry involves. I think that's really crucial for any scheme um, that it can it can be be changed really and, and evolve. Um, um, so yeah, there we are. I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into just a small part actually of Farming Connect, uh, our work here in Wales. Um, so yeah, I'd be pleased to take any questions if there are any. Brilliant. Thank you, Ania. Uh, um, could you just yep. stop sharing your screen? That'd be brilliant. Yeah. Um, and if people would like to ask a question, could they use the raise their hand electronically? That's the, uh, the best way. Um, if you go into uh, participants um, and uh, you should be able to lift your hand. I'm trying to remember exactly how to do that. Uh, ah, yes, we got, well, Madeline's there. Um, if you could unmute yourself, Madeline. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was such a fascinating presentation, actually, and really good to understand all the different elements of mentor a business coming from England. I've always found it a bit of a confusing landscape with all the different things that are going on. So it was just so clearly presented. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering really what the future plans are. Is there a commitment to carry on these programmes over the whole period of transition um, and sort of what, what is happening after Brexit with all of the amazing support on offer? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, a bit of uncertainty at the moment. So the current contract, uh, current Family Connect contract runs until August 2022 at the moment. Um, so yeah, we, we are in that kind of, gray area really between between programs at the moment which is I think common for for many many uh, regions of the UK at the moment um but um yeah we are we have been um we have been told by Welsh government that they are um they see a a, a knowledge transfer program continuing um for the for the next um round of, of programs so we are we are confident that um a scheme will exist yeah, but we're in the in the grey area between those schemes at the moment. Brilliant, thanks. Mary, can you switch your unmute and switch your 
camera on? Yeah, no problem. Diolch yn fawr chi, Einir, um, Mary Evans, ma. Um, I actually work for DEFRA in their policy department on the eligibility for the future schemes, okay. um, the environmental land management. And my question is, how do you go about targeting the venture program to young farmers? Is it through channels like the National Young Farmers Federation or uh, agribusiness um, business schools? How, how do you actually attract young farmers to know about the programs going on in the first place? Yeah, um, Diolch Mari, question there. Um, yeah, a variety of different methods, to be honest with you. Um, we are um, working closely with the young farmers, uh, particularly here in Wales, obviously, through our Agri Academy, they are partners in the junior program. Um, so they are involved in, in, you know, they know they know what is available. Um, and we depend then on on the um on the, the club network of clubs, for example, to to kind of um disseminate the, the information. Um Wales is quite unique, I suppose. We depend an awful lot on local knowledge. Um, so we have a um a network of development officers who are working um, for Farming Connect. So we have 18 development officers in each area of Wales. Um, and those development officers are the kind of the main entry point into Farming Connect. Um, they are living and working within their areas. They are, they're all from farming backgrounds themselves, which is essential. Um, so they, we depend a lot on that local knowledge really um, to, to not only to, to identify the, the potential new entrants, but also also the older generation, the, the farmers who maybe don't have a succession in plan in place. Um, so yeah, various communication methods. I briefly mentioned some of them in my presentation. So we there's a lot of focus on on digital marketing, um, particularly for for new entrants. But it is important to really keep things fresh. We feel we've got to constantly think of what's the next thing. Really, um, Facebook is really not not relevant anymore I'm, I'm i'm gonna say that i think um so we need to think what what platforms are are um are relevant now um so i mentioned instagram um we need to i need to figure out how tiktok works um and we need to get into the the you know the next big thing really we need to constantly evolve brilliant uh thanks very jenny Hi, thank you. That was really interesting. I also work for DEFRO uh, with Henry on new entrants at the moment. Um, I wondered, from your experience of the venture programme in Wales and the matching uh, success of the matching you've had in Wales, do you think it's transferable to England or because England is, is a bigger country with kind of more regions, do you think it would be difficult in terms of people not wanting to move, etc.? Yeah, definitely more difficult because as well, you're dealing with a lot more different sectors and different climate and topography as well, um, which is going to make it more challenging. Um, I don't know with moving areas, Wales is quite unique um, in terms of agriculture being so intrinsic to um, the culture um of 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 the country as well you know the 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 rural um communities are so tight-knit um and i'm i'm sorry if i'm suggesting that that doesn't quite exist in england because i'm sure it does in some areas um but it's it's definitely um that's definitely an element that makes it really challenging in wales that people don't want to move um but um what I mentioned earlier, one thing that is is really crucial is the advice element that comes with that matchmaking service. So I think a matchmaking service could work and it has been trialled before, hasn't it, through the, the, the land matching, um, through the fresh start. Um, but I think the limitations of it was um, just the funding, really. So if you could get some more funding um if you could get the the funding there for the for the advisory service to make sure that the once the matching has been done it's then followed through um and the professional advice is there to do the business planning and the legal guidance as well um so yeah i think it all all comes down to funding <laughs> so Thank i'll you. leave that to you <laughs> thanks you in uh, uh were you wanted to ask for 
Yes, please, Henry. Sorry, I wasn't able to do what you were asking me to do for some for some reason or to come in. It's um, easy to I come mean, on I, and then switch like... off, but. That, that's right, yeah. And I, I, I would like to congratulate Amy for her presentation. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join from the beginning and indeed all her colleagues that do all the great work that they do for Farming Connect in Wales. But my, my question or my observation actually is, is directed towards England and DEFRA um, because I mean, Amy has highlighted a number of the differences in, in policy um, landscape between England and Wales. But one of the advantages that England has or is about to have um, is the lump sum scheme that is in consultation at the moment. And, and one of the things that um, disappoints me really is that the connection between the lump sum scheme um, and new entrance policy doesn't seem to be as tight as I think it might be. Um, so you can take that as a question and respond to or you can take it as an observation but I do wonder why DEFRA isn't taking that opportunity to um, you know, because as Adrian said, one of the many barriers to all of this is availability of land. Clearly, it's by far not the only one. But this is an opportunity that England is likely to have next year, and, and I'm, I, I just don't get the impression that's been grasped by government there, in terms of helping new entrants. I mean, well, I think it's a bit unfair to ask you need to answer that. I, yeah. I think yeah, no, no, it, it was a question to you, Adrian. All oh, right, okay. Well, I'll, yeah. in, I'll, I'll respond to that in that. Um, we have certainly had conversations and explored potential connections. Obviously, the, um, the exit scheme is currently out for consultation. Uh, I think there's obviously it provides a huge opportunity. Um, the question is whether we try and do it on a positive basis in terms of looking, at, which we are doing, which is looking to talk to major landowners and so forth and uh, look for them to commit to uh, and recognize the benefits of new entrants, particularly in a fast changing world, or uh, put limitations on who uh, owners of land are able to pass them to. Uh, and that is, well, I mean, obviously a lot of people who will leave will be tenants and obviously they have no control uh, who the people, uh, uh, the, the, the landowners uh, rent to. Um, but also people who are selling, leaving their property, if you were to put limitations on who they could uh, sell the property to, that's a pretty big thing to do. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, you know, if people, everyone says that owns their land and want to, yes, uh, we're happy and that's not a big deal. But you imagine, you know, that your land, the value of your land would suddenly drop substantially because of limitations on who you could sell it to. Um, and there may not be a person with the right skills interest anyway to take it up. So, I mean, I think it's a very tricky thing. What we're certainly doing is exploring with landowners uh, the value and benefits. Uh, we're actually having a meeting this afternoon with uh, big institutional landowners and uh, trying to get the message across that actually new entrants are a positive uh, rather than a, uh, than a risk. Um, but uh, you know, these are, all these things are still out to consultation um, and uh, further discussion. But um, you know, it does seem to be a, quite a tricky one if we started uh, controlling uh, who people could send, sell their land to or who could just, people could uh, rent their land to. If I could just respond really quickly, and we're out hogging the agenda. I, I, I wasn't refer I wasn't thinking about limits. I was thinking about incentives, actually. And what sort of incentives were you thinking? So that somebody, so that a landowner would be, there would be some incentive for them to um, make it, a, a, to, to give preference to a new entrance over and above an established operator. I take your point about limiting, um, but if there was some sort of, I don't know whether it would be a taxation incentive or some sort of incentive so that it was more likely that the new entrance could benefit from this available land that's likely potentially to become available. Presumably, though, that would um, potentially apply to any. I mean, that's not really connected with exit. Well, I, I, I think it would be good to try and explore whether it is, you know, given that we've got those two policy objectives coming up at the same time, whether there couldn't be a way of linking those two things more closely. Mm -hmm. I, I acknowledge it's not easy. And, and you yeah. may well have considered it. Because I was thinking, well, the, what I've heard from people is saying, well, if you're going to get a benefit from exit, then you know there'll be some sort of requirement that the land has to go to a new entrant or something like that or new entrants were given some sort of advantage or or whatever um 
that I think is tricky. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So anyone else, no one else put their hand up yet. So I will ask a question. <laughs> I'm sort of, one of the questions that we're looking at and really interested in is how to reach out to people outside uh, traditional farming communities, um, people you know, in urban settings and uh, coming from different backgrounds um, of all sorts. Um, and I wondered if you had uh, attempted at all to do that, and whether it was an objective uh, uh, at all to get greater diversity um, into, yeah. uh, the, 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 into farming. No, we haven't, Henry, to answer your question quite simply, we haven't um, specifically tried to target groups from, from outside of, of kind of rural areas then. Um, and the limiting factor, I suppose, is, is comes back to that eligibility. Um, so to be eligible for Farming Connect and, and the, the programme at the moment, um, some... A, a commitment to the rural to the to the um, agriculture industry has got to be demonstrated in order to be able to access the the the, the whole suite of of um, of support. So um, so for example, they would need a relevant qualification or at least two years experience of working um, on the land. So that is probably a limiting factor, um, and. Um, there hasn't been much kind of, there hasn't been, um, there doesn't seem to be much ambition from Welsh Government to, to engage with um, with people from, from urban areas. Um, so yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't done much at all, really, to answer your question. Okay. Yeah. How are we doing? Um, We've got three more minutes. Um, I see there's one question on the chat here that's come in from Nick Green, um, just asking what is the average age of, of, of entrance um, and what, what proportion are from that family? <coughs> so I'll just answer that quickly, I suppose. Um, it's difficult to put a number on the average because I think that's a bit misleading. It, it does vary completely. Um, but if we're looking at how many of them are really serious about it and really going in, you know, committing to an opportunity, then they do tend to be older. So we're looking at people with in their in their late twenties and thirties, um, which again brings us back to that limiting factor again of people not wanting to move. Um, so what we find is that they are often they've already started families. Um, so they're not just moving themselves, they're, they're moving the whole family. Um, so yeah, they, they tend to be maybe older, older than pop, what people think. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got, uh, otherwise people are just saying brilliant presentation, which of course is absolutely right. Um, <laughs> um, actually, I, I've got another quick question because we've got two minutes. Um, did you, from the beginning, think that communications would be an important uh, uh, skill or, or training to provide, or did you? Was that something that came out of experience? And what sort of experience began to point yeah. you in that direction? No, definitely came out of experience. Um, just seeing um, pe people not really respecting the the, the landowner uh, and thinking about how right how am I going to communicate with this person you know they they weren't treating the opportunity as um as a job opportunity really we didn't see the professionalism there um so no we we didn't realize it was going to be such a a, a a a key aspect of the of the program until until after we started that's interesting so yeah. so people came in slightly expecting that they should get it and not and, and not seeing the, the point of view of the yeah absolutely and and really expecting that they could just kind of um yeah just turn up really and and, and thought that they the landowner would be pleased pleased to see them really um so um no we try and try and tell them that they there is an, an expectation for them to kind of prove really themselves as why 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 they deserve the opportunity um yeah very interesting indeed so it's 1.30 now, and uh, so we're, we're out of time, but thank you very much indeed. And it, it sounds, it looks a fantastic 
uh, uh, scheme that you have, and, and it's great that we can learn from it. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Look forward to seeing you next week for our uh, uh, next webinar.